Hello and welcome to Tech Deals Battle of the 6 core 12 thread CPU. We have four CPUs benchmarked today. First, second, and third generation Ryzen 5 and the i7-8700K. This video is for two groups of people. Number one, do you own a first or perhaps second generation Ryzen processor? Do you want to know how much real performance there is in going to the third generation? Is it worth the upgrade? Or maybe should you wait another year for fourth generation Ryzen? We're going to take a detailed look at the performance difference between these three generations of Ryzen processors and a value analysis. I'll take a look at their price and relative performance increase. And of course, it's ultimately up to you if it's worth it. But hopefully this information is helpful. The second group of people for whom this video is helpful is if you are upgrading from something older, whatever that might be, you might be asking the question, should you buy a brand new third generation Ryzen and a new motherboard and new everything? Or is there value in looking at the first and second generation of chips? The Ryzen 5 1600X can be found for around $100 on eBay these days. That is substantially less than the $200 or $250 of the new Zen 2 chips. You can buy the Ryzen 5 2600X brand new right now on Amazon for $160. That is $90 less than the 3600X. They both come with the same Wraith Spire cooler. It's very nice. Is it worth buying or should you spend the extra money for Zen 2? We're going to take a detailed look at that in this video, gaming and non-gaming benchmarks and of course comparison to Intel. Now Intel is here to provide you with sort of a rough benchmark of the top end performance. Intel has been known as being the best for the past several years and it is the best. And frankly, that's not changing just yet. Overall, on average, it's a little bit faster than even the new Zen 2 chips but not by much. And when you take into account it's $350 price, plus it needs a cooler, plus in all honesty, if you're spending that much on a CPU, it probably deserves a more expensive motherboard. It really is not the deal here whatsoever. So for the vast majority of you watching, it's do you upgrade from first to third? Do you upgrade from something way older? And if so, to what? Or do you just keep what you have for a bit and uh, maybe upgrade next year when Ryzen fourth gen comes out, which should be the last uh, CPU that works on the AM4 platform, first, second, third, and fourth gen. And then in 2021, we should get AM5, which will be a whole new platform. And hopefully that lasts for another four years, just like AM4 did. I mentioned we had four CPUs on the desk. There are others besides these that are six cores, 12 threads. One of the ones I've recommended in the past is the i7-6800K, six cores, 12 threads, Broadwell E. I built a machine based on this in 2016. If you have one, I'd actually strongly consider keeping it at this point. It's still a great processor. It has very similar performance to the first generation Ryzen 5 1600X. And if you've already invested the money, then go ahead and keep it for another few years. You can go all the way back to the first generation of processors. The X5675 is an excellent example. It fits into X58 motherboards dating back nearly 10 years. Six cores, 12 threads, overclockable on the right board. Those are interesting, but we're not taking a look at them today because there's a lot of reasons of why I don't think those are a great CPU in 2019, but I will cover those in the dedicated video. I am also not comparing any of these CPUs in this video to older chips. When I say, if you're upgrading, should you get one of these chips or should you buy Zen 2? I'm assuming you've already made the upgrade decision. Direct comparisons will come in other videos. I've already done a video linked in the video description below, FX8300 at four gigahertz compared to Ryzen 5 3600X. There was a huge performance difference there, but maybe you have that. Maybe you have a high-end Core 2 Quad or an i5-2400. Perhaps you even have something a little bit newer such as an i7-4770K it's still nice in 2019, but the four cores are getting a little bit up there in years if you play the latest AAA games, Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Battlefield V looking at you. If you have made the decision to upgrade, which one should you buy if you're looking for a six core 12 thread chip? I will do this same comparison on the Ryzen 7 line, 1700X, 2700X and 3700X in a future video. Today, we're just looking at six core chips. 
For our test configuration today, we have the ASUS ROG Strix X470-F motherboard. It is a very nice premium board that lets me install any of the three generation of Ryzen CPUs on it. We have the first, second, and third gen installed here using the Wraith Spire cooler that comes included with the second and third generation CPUs. Strictly stock settings were used on all three CPUs, no power boost overdrive or anything else was turned on, but we did have XMP for the RAM turned on. 32 gigabytes of Corsair Vengeance Pro RGB RAM, DDR4 3200MHz CL16 was installed and it was run at those settings. On the Intel side, we have a very nice ASRock Z390 Tai Chi motherboard. Same exact RAM was installed, Corsair Vengeance Pro CL16 DDR4 3200. Both test benches, and it was also run at stock. For our graphics card today, we have the ASUS ROG Strix RTX 2080 Ti Factory Overclocked Edition. It is a wonderful, wonderful graphics card, and it's extreme overkill for most of these CPUs but it's here to lift the graphics card as a limitation so we can see the true performance difference between these processors. A word of note about graphics cards in general, you can usually replace your CPU every other graphics card cycle that you replace a graphics card. If you keep a graphics card for three years, you might very well get six years out of your CPU. You'll do a midlife graphics card upgrade. It's a relatively simple swap. Today's RTX 2080 Ti becomes tomorrow's RTX 4060. This 1200R graphics card will become a 400R graphics card in just a couple of years. Point to consider, today's RTX 2060 is a little bit faster than a GTX 980 Ti, which just a few years ago was the top end card. It wasn't $1,200 because Nvidia didn't do that back then. That's a different conversation for another time. But today's X60 card is two generations ago, 980 Ti or 1080 Ti or whatever card. So a couple of years from now, don't be shocked if you can buy this level of performance for that kind of mid-range $350 to $400 price point. If you're buying one of these CPUs to keep it for five or six years, this gives you an idea of what you can expect to upgrade to if you want to upgrade to a new graphics card during the CPU's life. As for motherboards, the B450 is where it's at. The B550s are delayed and are not coming until early 2020. So it's B450 or, well, you could go with the new X570s. They cost too much, in my opinion. That might change over time, but at least at launch prices, the decent ones start at $200. You can find a really nice board, like, for example, the MSI B450 Tomahawk or this Gigabyte B450 Aorus Pro Wi-Fi. I did a build in this board, about $100, maybe $110. Yes, it has RGB, but it has two M.2 slots. It has a fixed I.O. plate on the back instead of a thing you have to plug into your case. Very convenient. It's got uh, Wi-Fi, of course, and a bunch of other features on it. You're paying for features, not performance. This or the $65 B450 boards, they all perform the same. This will have better support for future CPUs, higher-end CPUs, Ryzen 7s, possibly Ryzen 9s, and it's got more USB ports and more accessories. So if you combine, say, a Ryzen 5 2600X for $160 and a board like this for $100 or $110, you get yourself a bit of a powerhouse going. Want more performance? The 3600 or 3600 would be a nice choice as well. The 3600 results are not in this video. That will be a separate video because it's a lot of testing to test all of this stuff, but watch for that coming soon in the future. Well, I think that's enough of the general overview. How about we get to some benchmarks? Quick note, MSI Afterburner provides the real-time performance numbers you're about to see in these benchmarks, and all the benchmarks were recorded on an external computer using a hardware capture card, no performance lost. What you are watching is the actual benchmarks as they were run and recorded for the charts that you're about to see. Let's get to the benchmarks. First up, we have Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And yes, the text is much smaller than normal because we have four results on the screen. On the top, we have the Ryzen 5 1600X and the Ryzen 5 2600X. And on the bottom, the Ryzen 5 3600X and the i7-8700K for comparison's sake. Now, if you really want to study these numbers in detail, you'll probably have to go through these benchmarks more than once because I've put 30 seconds of footage from each one into this video. I thought about doing a minute to make it a little bit longer and make it easier for you to see individual results, but the problem with that is it makes the video really, really long, and I don't think everybody wants to see that much. 
So rather than doing that, I'm going to talk in generalities and I'm going to point out a few key facts and a few key numbers as we go. But the live footage here with the real-time numbers up plus the benchmark charts I'm about to show you hopefully give you a good enough idea of what to expect. Here we have Dusex Mankind Divided. This is an absolutely brutal benchmark. I've tested this on a variety of machines. And yeah, it's just really, really tough to run well. It takes a lot of graphics and a lot of CPU. Take a look at the performance difference between the 1600X and the two bottom chips. That's a fairly large gap, considering none of these are graphics card limited. We are completely CPU limited in all of these tests here, and that's a fairly large performance jump. Here we have the average frame rates of the first three games I've shown. Because we're testing four different CPUs here, I've made the charts every three games. So you're going to see it more often, but there's more detail to see. There is an average of a 34% performance increase between the 1600X and the 3600X between these three games. It's going to vary, of course, as we get into more games, but 87 frames per second on the 1600X and Mankind Divided versus 120 is a very solid performance improvement. Notice that going to an i7-8700K only gets you four more frames. It's a lot more money for a fairly small performance increase. In Dawn of War 3, the 3600X actually beats the 8700K. These are rounding errors. You run that four or five times, you'll get those to move up or down by one, but it does in fact win, and basically it's an effective tie in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Ryzen 5 3600X very much is the overall equal of the 8700K, and that's pretty impressive for a CPU that is $250 with an excellent included cooler. Moving on to F1 2018. Yes, this game runs absolutely spectacular. We do have an overkill graphics card, but I would like to point out, and I've said this before, I'll say this again, we are testing CPUs here, not graphics cards. Take a look at the very first percentage number on all of these results. Notice it is not at 100% or 99% as it usually sits. So the graphics card is not the limitation in these tests the CPU is. If you put a lower end graphics card in, all of the numbers will come down and they will compress a little bit. I do plan to take a look at a subset of these games in a future video with like an RX 580 and the new RX 5700 XT graphics cards to give you an idea of what a 200 and 400R graphics card will do and whether or not the there is still a large performance difference. We will look at that in a future video. Here we have Far Cry 5, an absolutely brutal game that typically very much favors Intel. And as you see here, the 3600X is doing very well, but the other two aren't too far behind. It's very, very playable on those. It just is certainly going to be a bit slower. In this scene here in Far Cry New Dawn, we're at about 75 to 80 frames per second on the 1600X versus 110 frames per second on the i7-8700K. To be blunt, that's a fairly decent performance increase on the i7 for like all of the extra monies because there is a huge price difference between those chips. Coming onto the chart, the average frame rate differences here show solid jumps from first to second to third gen Ryzen. Look at F1 2018. Now all of these are of course very fast and very playable. Just because there's a big increase doesn't make the old chips useless. A 1600X here did 185 frames per second. Even if you have a 144 hertz, hertz monitor and you want great performance, that's amazing. But it jumps to 234 on the 3600X. That's a solid increase. Now on Far Cry 5 and Far Cry New Dawn, you'll notice that Intel of course wins. It is a bit faster overall, but that 3600X sure closes the gap. Having said that, take a look at the 1600. 101 and 89 frames per second are very, very solid results. If you're okay with those frame rates and you have a first gen chip or are thinking of buying one, it still performs great today. Looking at the minimum frame rates, which we won't look at in detail for every game, but I'll point it out here. Even minimum frame rates on the 1600X were still above 60 frames per second. Now those are going to be lower on a lower end graphics card to be sure, but if you want to see what the CPUs are capable of, yes, you can play modern AAA demanding games at 60 frames per second on the 1600X. Or if you want higher lows and higher minimums and closer to Intel performance, well hey, the 3600X is sitting right in front of you. 
Final Fantasy XV. This particular benchmark has its challenges, I'm aware of that, but for CPU comparisons, I think it's a very effective benchmark. It's demanding, it's six minutes long, which makes it long enough to be interesting and to really get a decent benchmark. So many of these benchmarks are only a minute long, so you gotta run them three, four, five, six times in order to average out the results and try to get consistency. This, I generally only run three times, and I take the two second runs in order to get the results because, frankly, it's a long benchmark and the first one is loading everything into RAM and buffering and cleaning everything out. I generally discard the first results from every single run and then usually average between three to five additional runs depending upon the game they're all a little bit different. Here we have For Honor and the frame rates are just absolutely ridiculous. The actual game and especially the new expansion are going to run a bit slower and you get into heavy multiplayer games the, the frame rate is going to be a bit slower. These frame rates are almost useless for comparison because they are so high, they go way beyond what the average person has for a monitor. But at least it shows you what is possible. Forza Horizon 4 is very much a graphics card game and not a CPU game. In fact, these three games included in this batch here, Final Fantasy XV, For Honor, and Forza Horizon 4, you're going to see a compression of frame rates where they're all kind of awesome and amazing and the CPU matters less. Some games very much care about your CPU and some don't. These are the don't. And here are the results. Very, very small differences between these uh, three games on these four processors. If these are the games you play, then it may not matter all that much which CPU you have. A quick note on the lows here, it is worth noting that the minimums are very hard to measure in short benchmark runs. That four honor run is so short, you have to run the thing a bunch of times in order to try to even them out, and even then it's not perfect, because it only takes a frame or two to throw it off. I am aware that some people want to see 1% lows, that makes it much more challenging and time consuming to run these benchmarks, and doesn't really get you that much when the benchmarks are 60 seconds long each, which is why I don't include them. I do in live gameplay, but not here. And if you want further proof that an RTX 2080 Ti is awesome, look at these numbers. This is graphics card right here. Holy smokes, 363 frames per second in For Honor. Ghost Recon Wildlands, a very fun game. I've mentioned it many times before. This is very graphics card dependent. Take a look at the two bottom ones. We are nearly using 100%, not quite, but nearly 100% of our graphics card on the two top end processors, and that frame rate is spectacular. But it's not terrible on the two lower end CPUs, well over 100 frames per second. If this shows you anything, it's that if you're gonna get a great graphics card, get a great CPU. If you have a mid-range graphics card, then you don't need the top of the line CPU, because at some point, it's probably going to get starved. Grand Theft Auto V. Now, I did actually record a live gameplay of 10 plus minutes on each of these CPUs. I'm going to make a separate video about it because I want to do an updated comparison. Live gameplay versus benchmarking and 1% lows versus minimums and benchmarking. That'll be coming up at some point here in the near future. But as you can see here that the graphics card is absolutely, utterly bored. It's not even running at full clock speed on these cards. This game is almost, what, five years old now? And it really just shows how... Very, very mid-range computers can play GTA 5 just fine. All of this hardware here is really overkill for GTA 5. Come on, bring on the GTA 6 already. We're waiting for it. Metro Exodus. There is a very solid performance difference here. Take a look at the two bottom CPUs and take a look at the two top CPUs because that's really the segmentation here as you look at the various results. This game runs great on all of them, but it does run noticeably better on the two faster chips. And here you can see 92 and 101 is an average of Metro Exodus on the 16 and 2600X versus 112 and 119 on the two top end chips. The gap is actually greater in the other two games. Even though I just got done saying Grand Theft Auto 5 is older now, 94 to 123 is not a small difference. That's a fairly decent difference for just two years on CPU. And of course the graphics card played no role there because it's insane, ridiculous overkill. Ghost Recon Wildlands, 112 to 142. This demonstrates the pure raw performance difference between these generations and why Intel has been ahead of AMD even during the first two gens of Ryzen. 
The minimum frame rate chart here shows this even more dramatically. 79 and 91 on GTA 5 versus 103. On Ghost Recon, it's 99 to 105, which is nice, but the 127 minimum of the 3600X is really, really close to the 8700K. You'll also notice that the 3600X and the 8700K are the only two to hit 60 frames per second in the minimums. Yes, the first two are not very far behind, but this is the kind of performance that we've been waiting for from AMD. Now moving on to games that really have awesome performance, Rainbow Six Siege's built-in benchmark is a nice comparison tool, even if it doesn't necessarily reflect all the real-world gameplay in an intense online multiplayer game, but frankly a 1600X with half this graphics card would be plenty to play this. If you had one of the new Navi cards, the 5700XT or a 2060 Super, combined with any of these CPUs, you're gonna get incredible frame rates into the hundreds of frames per second without any issue whatsoever. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is a poster child for why six core 12 thread chips are enough in 2019, but won't be for much more than the next two or three years or so. If you want a five to six year processor, it needs to have eight cores and 16 threads, because not only are we using all the cores here, we're using almost all the threads. It's still great performance, but another couple of generations of games, and especially when the new consoles launch, and this may very well come up short but they're very, very nice for today. Then we come to Steep. This is a game I just started benchmarking a few weeks ago. It's a completely different kind of game than I've basically been benchmarking up to this point. It's sort of a sports game, obviously, as you can see. The performance is very, very good. Let me know what you think of this, and of course, suggestions on games you'd like to see benchmarked. That's what the comment section is for down below. Interestingly enough, it's very easy to take two different points of view out of these results. On one hand, the 1600X runs these mo runs most of these games well over 100 frames per second. You can see here 127 frames per second in Steep, 108 frames per second in Shadow of the Tomb Raider. So what's the issue? Why do you need anything more? Besides the fact that we're over graphics card. But ignoring that point, why in the world do you need more? The percentage difference is an interesting thing to look at. Going from 108 to 115, to 134, to 148 in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, you can see what additional CPU power gets you if you have sufficient graphics card. Now, I am fully aware that most people aren't putting these cards on. I know I've beaten that drum horse a bit, but let me offer this thought. If you buy a CPU to keep for the next five to six years, which I think it should be an eight core chip if you do, but putting that issue aside because not everybody agrees with me, if you do, you're gonna upgrade the graphics card mid-life. Mid-level graphics cards like an RX 5700 XT or a 2060 Super are not going to last you six years in AAA games. They might not last you three. They might, but it'll start to get kind of sketchy in that third year. What this shows you is how much future uplift these CPUs have when you upgrade the graphics card next time and keep your CPU. Why can all game companies not make games optimized like Strange Brigade? This game is gorgeous. Look at the waterfall and the explosions and the colors. Look how fast it's moving through the environment, the bridge, the fog, the tree limbs, the characters. In fact, the final scene here has so many characters and so much detail on screen. And we're running at nearly 300 frames per second on the i7 and really close to that on the 3600X. Why are all games not this well optimized? Come on, game companies, stop being slack. The Division. This is actually amazingly optimized until you get into the multiplayer, which I've also talked about before. The Dark Zone PvP multiplayer does not remotely run this fast. The frame rates easily get cut in half, if not more. And I do think a better modern CPU is especially useful if you're doing that. But for the story modes, I can tell you from experience, a Ryzen 5 1600X at stock speeds would be absolutely plenty to play through the entire game of The Division and The Division 2 in story mode. Look at that. We're getting 135, 140, 150 frames per second on a 1600X. That's great. That's spectacular. That's amazing. It's it's a single player game, especially the dark mode stuff. What more do you need? Now the i7 is doing over 200 frames per second, and that's very, very impressive. And it certainly is a definite speed boost over the lower end chip for like all the additional monies. But we'll talk about the money in just a minute. World of Tanks. World of Tanks has recently become an updated game that uses more cores and threads than it used to 
although not in this benchmark. This benchmark was released when they did the big 1.0 graphical update, and the game has since received some additional updates. Somebody commented on this to me the other day and said, why aren't you testing it in the actual game? Because this benchmark actually is now slightly out of date with the live game, and I appreciate that. Do you know how long it takes to effectively benchmark World of Tanks playing on the live server in games to get like-kinded games on the same maps in the same environment? That is a very challenging thing to do, so I'm using the built-in benchmark for these tests. In games like Strange Brigade and even the First Division, which are now getting a little bit dated, that game's been out for over three years now, the differences here aren't huge. From first to third gen Ryzen, it's 11 and 14% difference respectively. But in World of Tanks, it is 34% faster, which both, again, these numbers will be lower on the live server. If you want a 34% performance increase, that's not bad, just two years back to back. As you look at these minimums and you look at these maximums, you may very well be asking the question, holy smokes, these things run so well, what's the point of all this? Well, as I said at the beginning of this video, some people are looking to upgrade from first or second gen Ryzen to third gen Ryzen, and other people are looking to upgrade to any of these because they have older CPUs. This demonstrates what the performance difference, the raw CPU performance difference is between all of these chips, and we'll talk about the value equation of that in just a minute. Moving on to perhaps the most boring chart of this entire benchmark, 3D Mark, I included the CPU FPS numbers from these results, or in case of Port Royale, it's just the FPS because it's really a graphics card test. The reason I included Port Royale is that it's an RTX graphics test and it demonstrates if you are graphics card limited, you probably won't see much of a performance difference, at least in terms of averages, between various CPUs. You might still on the lows, the 1% or the minimums, but not in terms of averages. But even on Time Spy and Fire Strike, the differences here are pretty minor. Interested in VR? There is a 32% performance difference between the 1600X and 3600X on the orange room and a 30% difference on the cyan room. Notice the blue room is exactly the same across the board. Again, absolutely, totally 100% graphics card limited. Our RTX 2080 Ti cannot run that any faster, so the CPUs don't matter. But those frame rates would be kind of sketchy for serious VR use. They're actually pretty good for the blue room, but it's still not quite up to the recommended minimum. Yes, the 3600X is demonstrably faster than the 1600X. The question to be asked is, do we care when the numbers are this high? How about file compression, decompression? On compression performance, the 3600X is 35% faster than a 1600X. That's a real solid performance improvement. But on decompressing speed, it's only 23% faster. So overall, it's a nice improvement, but is it enough to upgrade? Well, that's a personal thing you might have to answer for yourself. I will offer you this thought. If you're seriously interested in 7-zip file compression performance, why do you not have a Ryzen 7 or Ryzen 9? Moving on to Blender, which is a real solid 3D benchmark that takes real time to run, unlike Cinebench, but we'll get to Cinebench because everybody loves playing with it. It's quick, fast, and easy to benchmark. 27 minutes on the 1600X, 25 minutes on the 2600X, 21 minutes and 38 seconds on the 3600X, and 22 minutes and 21 seconds on the 1800X. That is a 20% improvement in performance going from a 1600X to a 3600X. 20% is solid, but like 7-Zip, if you are serious about Blender, you wouldn't be buying a Ryzen 5 anything. You'd be buying a Ryzen 7 or Ryzen 9, or to be completely blunt, if you're very serious, you were already on Threadripper a year or two ago. As promised, here's Cinebench R20. There is a 35% performance difference between 1600X and 3600X in the multi-core performance test. That's a very solid improvement. Again, Ryzen 7, Ryzen 9 would be the obvious choices if you actually cared about this sort of thing. But let me offer you this thought. If you already own 1600X, you're spending really good money for a 35% performance improvement, which is nice, but it's not going to be mind-blowing. It's not like going from an FX8300 to a Ryzen 5 anything. It really isn't. In my opinion, upgrade when you can at least get 50% more performance, which will probably be the 4th gen Ryzen, or better yet, when you can double your performance, which again would be a Ryzen 7 here. 
Just proof positive that picking your benchmarks picks your results. The multi-core test of CPU-Z only shows a 21% improvement between the 1600X to the 3600X. So how much gain you get very much depends upon which benchmark that you run. Finally, we get to the overall average gain performance boost between these CPUs. Normalizing at 100%, the Ryzen 5 2600X was on average 10% faster than the 1600X across all 19 games tested. The Ryzen 5 3600X was 24% faster or 124% of the speed of a 100% normalized 1600X. The i7-8700K was 129% of the 100% performance from the 1600X. So yeah, there's about a 5% performance gap between a stock 3600X and a stock 8700K, but given the cost of the Intel platform, I don't think it's worth it. That 3600X is very nice, unless we look at the price. Here is where it gets a bit ugly on the new CPUs. You can currently buy a Ryzen 5 1600X with a cooler for about $125 on eBay. The Ryzen 5 3600X brand new from Amazon is $160 with a Wraith Spire cooler and the Ryzen 5 3600X is $250 from Amazon with the Wraith Spire cooler. The i7-8700K is $350 and I'm adding a $30 Hyper 212 Black to that to bring it up to $380. So the price increase of a 2600X over a 1600X is a 28% price increase for a 10% performance increase. The 3600X is a 100% price increase over a 1600X for a 24% performance increase. And the i7-8700K is a 204% price increase for a 29% price increase. See how ludicrous it gets to get, quote, the best? The fact of the matter is, the sweet spot here is actually the Ryzen 5 2600X, not the 3600X. If you're buying new and you want the best value for the money, 10% more performance for 28% more money is a much, much better value than 24% more performance for 100% more money, at least in my opinion. But these numbers do not include the motherboards. These do. Once you include the cost of a motherboard, and I'm using an $85 B450 motherboard on the Ryzen side, and I'm using a $100 H370 board on the Intel side, notice that the gap actually narrows a bit. 17% more money for the 2600X for 10% more performance, 60% more money for 24% more performance, or 129% more money for 29% more performance. And yes, that's just ironic how that works out in the chart, but they're really not related because one's going off zero and the other's going off 100. But I'd like to point out that the 2600X is actually the deal here, not the 3600X, unless you really want that Intel-like performance. But you are paying a premium for it unless you're watching this video in six months and the prices have all changed and dropped and then that doesn't really count. I'm going off of what they cost in July of 2019. What a time to be in computers. We have choices and performance galore. The options are the best they've been in a long time. The i7-8700K is a great CPU until you look at its current price. If Intel drops the price, fine. I'm willing to consider it again, but at the current $350 price, as far as I'm concerned, it's no longer even an option. The new Zen 2 chips are great. And as you saw, their performance is really, really close to the 8700K. But $250 with a great stock cooler, the 3600X is still more expensive for its performance than the first and second gen chips. The Ryzen 5 1600X is actually the best deal on the table here, but that's a used CPU with a third party cooler and frankly, the additional cost for a Ryzen 5 2600X I think is worth the money. So my suggested build in July of 2019 is a Ryzen 5 2600X, a no more than $100 B450 motherboard, the $85 Gigabyte Aorus M, the micro ATX board would be a great choice for a CPU like this, and you'll have tremendous value and performance for the money in a computer that will last you many years to come and have at least a little bit of upgrade room. Although by the time I think you need to upgrade any of these CPUs, AM5 will be here in 2021 and you'll need a new platform and it's not really going to matter unless of course third or fourth generation chips are discounted at some point, which I'm sure they will be. 
Now that brings us to the Ryzen 5 uh, 3600, which we did not benchmark in this video. That will be in a future video. I, it takes a long time to do this many benchmarks and this many tests. There is an argument that says for an extra $40, move from the 2600X to the 3600. In theory, this should be faster by a very small amount than the X chip, the 2600, but it doesn't come with as good of a stock cooler. It comes with a stealth rather than the Spire. And I'm not a big fan of the stealth. That's okay. If this came with a Spire, I'd be all over it. It wouldn't even be a question. It would be the indisputed winner here. But because it only comes with a small, small cooler and it doesn't come with the big one that's in here, I'm not jumping up and down about it. We'll have to test that and see. Like this video if you like it. Share it with your friends if you loved it. Remember to subscribe to my channel with the big huge red button directly below. Hit the bell notification icon next to it to be notified when new live streams and new videos come out. Be sure to check the links in the video description below. Used and new CPUs will be linked down there to Amazon, Newegg, and eBay. Check current prices. At some point in the future, these are going to get a price drop, and they'll probably run over the value of these, and then Zen 2 will make a little bit more sense. And there's no harm in buying those today. Just realize that in terms of price to performance, the 2600X is a better deal today than the 3600X, even including a motherboard in that price equation. Linked in the description below, you will also find Twitch, Twitter, Discord. We have a very nice Tech Deals Discord down there. Stop by and say hello and join our community. Thank you all so much for watching. I appreciate it. I will see all of you next time.